1963 in America, and um, the Chrysler Corporation engineers have been working uh, on this type of vehicle for about a little over a dozen years, early, since the early 50s. This is, I think, uh, the fourth generation of the vehicle. And this, gener this, this generation, the fourth gen, actually came so close to actually being a production car that uh, Chrysler actually contracted Ghia and they built, um, I think it's somewhere between 50 and 55 bodies. They built 50, 55 cars and they actually loaned them to the general public for evaluation. That's how close this car actually came to going into production. And in fact, I have read different stuff that said in 1966 uh, was the first year for the new Dodge Charger that they had actually um, initially slated 500 Chargers to be designed with this same engine. So what engine am I talking about? It's not the Chrysler 318. It's not the Chrysler, you know, some of the classic Chrysler engines, 383 or 440 or even 426. This is a gas turbine engine. Let me say that again. This is a gas turbine engine propelled vehicle. Chrysler were not the first company to design a car that had a turbine uh, power plant. In fact, uh, that distinction goes to Rover in uh, in Britain. Uh, they had uh, done so, um, I think the, uh, the Rover Jet 1 was produced in 1950, if I'm not mistaken. And the power plants are, <laughs> strangely enough, very, very similar in design, right? But um, maybe we'll look at that briefly in, a, in another uh, episode uh, because the credit certainly goes to Rover for being the first, but the credit goes to Chrysler um, because the credit goes to Chrysler in the sense that this almost became a reality as far as it being in the public's hands. Rover, if you watch some of the footage from their testing and stuff, is really rough. It is quite, uh, it is a little more than a prototype vehicle, I think, in, uh, in, uh, in reality for Rover. But this almost hit the road and very, very nearly did. That's why I'm focusing on the, uh, the Chrysler turbine, by the way. It has no other name other than the turbine. Let's take a look at the engine. So the way this system actually functions is it starts to rotate. The compressor will actually compress the air. Um, the air travels into the burner can where uh, fuel is added, is ignited. And by the way, the ignition is only for initial ignition. Once the burn is actually established in the can, you can actually switch the, uh, the plug off and uh, the ignition is self-sustaining. And uh, the whole point to the uh, burner can, of course, is, is to take the fuel in the air, mix it, um, and obviously when the fuel is ignited, um, the mix is expanded many, many times. Uh, it's the expansion of those gases that is actually utilized in order to drive the turbine. So that's simple enough, right? Compressor, uh, fuel and air into the burner can, it's ignited, and the expansion of those gases actually drives the turbine and the system is on a common shaft and the turbine rotation is actually fed back to the compressor and it's a self-sustaining system. Pretty simple, few moving parts. In this system, like on an aircraft, uh, there's a nozzle that actually uh, utilizes the thrust in order to propel the aircraft, right? That's obviously no good for an automotive application uh, so what they've done is, in addition to this, they've added a uh, power takeoff, if you will, behind the uh, um, compressor turbine in order to extract the power and uh, have mechanical rotation uh, to a gearbox, a lot more practical, as opposed to thrust. Let's see that. Okay, so here's a simplified version of what we're actually going to see that's in the uh, Chrysler turbine. Uh, same setup to this point here and after here you can see they've added an additional turbine also also uh, axial flow and uh, Through a shaft. It's actually driving a gearbox and um, 
that output shaft is actually a, uh, uh, drives just a traditional uh, gearbox. I think it's the uh, uh, torque flight that Chrysler actually used in the uh, in the turbine. So here's the engine in uh, cutaway. Um, obviously a lot to take in. So let's just look at it schematically uh, one more time before we get back to this drawing and see if we can make some sense of it. Okay, so uh, here's a schematic diagram that actually shows um, a little closer to the flow um, in reality uh, in the engine within the engine. Um, there's two items here. Uh, for now, we'll ignore them for the meantime, but they are uh, essential components of uh, the efficient operation of this particular turbine. Uh, they're essentially heat exchangers. Again, more about the, those in just a minute. So here's the centrifugal compressor again. Here's the uh, actual air intake and uh, the uh, compressor throws the air out. As I said, um, it comes through this heat exchanger here before it actually enters into the uh, burner can on both sides. And um, this heat exchanger is unlike a turbocharger that you might be thinking, well, um, they're actually cooling the uh, charge. Actually, it's the other way around. They're actually adding heat energy uh, at this particular point here. Uh, so in addition to the, the heat from the compression, uh, there is additional heat added by the heat exchanger before it actually goes to the uh, burner can. Uh, that's done in the interest of efficiency because without uh, the uh, heat exchangers or regenerators as uh, Chrysler actually termed them, the fuel consumption in this particular unit was horrendous. It was never going to be accepted by the public. So uh, through the... Uh, the uh, use of these uh, heat exchangers, they actually um, improved the fuel economy um, significantly. So that air actually comes into the uh, burner can. Again, the uh, fuel is added, it's ignited. So the combustion uh, process goes on within the can. Uh, those gases are uh, expelled and they pass the uh, two wheels as we've seen earlier in the schematic. Uh, the one wheel actually drives the uh, compressor, it's on the common shaft, and the other wheel, again, two uh, axial uh, stages, this is completely independent of the first stage, is actually utilized to drive the, uh, the gearbox, to drive the car itself. Uh, after there passes the two turbine wheels, that, that hot, uh, those hot gases actually go over the uh, heat exchanger, and then these heat exchangers were actually a matrix that were mechanically rotated through a drive shaft mechanism. And um, that constant rotation actually exchanged the, uh, the heat energy between the exhaust and the intake air. So it was, they utilized this design for two reasons. Uh, it, firstly, it lowered the um, uh, exhaust gases, uh, the exhaust gas temperature, so you weren't blistering the paint on the car that was actually following you. And it actually added heat energy to the, uh, to the intake charge. So um, it was actually a twofold um, process, twofold advantage by utilize, utilizing these uh, heat exchangers. And the discharge uh, temperature of the exhaust gases was actually very reasonable. In fact, it was in some publications, uh, they said it was actually lower than uh, a standard internal combustion uh, piston type engine, the discharge uh, gases. Okay, I realize this is not the best uh, the best graphic here guys a lot of the detail is actually quite dark but um there's not actually that many images and certainly no certainly none i've been able to find that actually really detail the flow of the uh, air through the engine i do have a graphic for the uh for the uh, rover engine which is very very similar um but unfortunately none for the gas flow through the uh, through the chrysler um so let's see if we can make some sense of this <clears throat> Um, an obvious uh, significant component here, and it looks rather like a huge air filter, um, is this component here. Well, these are the two uh, uh, cylindrical, um, basically uh, circular type uh, heat exchangers, and they're on both sides of the engine. There's the through shaft, and the drive mechanism actually comes off the gearbox at the front here. So these are not filters, these are actually heat exchangers that exchange the, the uh, heat between the intake and the exhaust uh, gases, as I mentioned earlier. So up front, this is actually the intake of the engine here. There was a massive air uh, 
uh, air box uh, on the uh, Chrysler turbine in order to, I think, essentially quiet the sound of the uh, the suction from the uh, from the turbine uh, engine itself. Um, massive uh, air box installation under under the hood, so the air actually comes in here. Um, you can see here is the uh, the compressor again, a centrifugal type compressor. Uh, you can see there's a common shaft that goes between the compressor uh, and the uh, turbine here. This is the, uh, the, tur the turbine that actually drives the compressor and the shaft is carried through to the uh, accessory gearbox here, we'll call it, right? This gearbox here is what actually had the uh, fuel pump, uh, the oil pump. Uh, the starter was a starter generator, so it was utilized uh, in both capacities. And the car actually had two batteries, I believe, and the... Um, toggled it to put the batteries in series for a 24 volt start in order to get the, uh, the turbine up to speed to actually turn on the fuel and ignition um, and then it went back to a 12 volt system for, for the rest of the vehicle um, but yeah this was the compressor uh, the air is thrown out you can actually see what looked like wedges here that's a, a 28 channel diffuser um, as the air actually passes through the diffuser, it's a, a divergent type duct, so the, the pressure actually goes up. Um, in the plenum here, uh, or the, uh, what's the word, uh, I guess it's like a volute, um, the air is distributed around to the burner can here, from the two sides that we see in the schematic. Burner can is down the bottom here. That's the igniter plug, again only used for initial, initial lighting of the engine. Once it's lit, it can actually turn the ignition off and there's a fuel nozzle here. So there's an, uh, an exciter module here that drove the, uh, the plug. And again, I mentioned there is a fuel pump somewhere on the drawing here. We can speculate it's somewhere driven by the gearbox for certain. And the fuel is added to the burner can here through the fuel nozzle. Uh, the burn actually goes on. And inside the ducting here, difficult to imagine, but you can see some <laughs> some flow through here but kind of difficult to imagine but we've seen it in schematic um, the burner can expels its exhaust uh, gases over both stages of the turbines here uh, so that's the turbine that drives the compressor and carries on and actually drives the uh, the power uh, turbine the power takeoff of the system so it's this shaft here that actually goes on through a reduction gear um, what kind of speeds are we talking about? Oh, nothing less than uh, 22,000 RPM idle, and I think double that in operation. So a significant reduction gearbox would obviously be uh, required in order to reduce that uh, output speed down to the gearbox uh, to make it reasonable for uh, road speeds for the wheels themselves. Significant gear reductions going on there. So um, I know this is difficult to uh, envision the flow through here again, guys. Again, just quickly, intake through the compressor, centrifugal compressor, thrown out through the diffuser, down through the plenum to the burner can. The burner can uh, mixes the air and the fuel, and those hot gases go over both stages of the uh, uh, first and second stage turbine. Uh, first stage turbine is driving the compressor and the gearbox, and the uh, free turbine here, which is actually the power turbine, actually driving the, uh, uh, the output gearbox, which goes to the torque flight transmission as I mentioned. A lot to take in, I get it. <laughs> so here's actually a shot of the Rover, guys. That's actually the uh, third generation, I believe, of the vehicle that Rover developed in the early 50s. And here is a shot of the, uh, the engine. In fact, uh, there is in cutaway, very, very similar. You can see the uh, distinctive heat exchangers there that uh, forgot to mention when I was talking about the gas flow actually through the engine itself uh, just a moment ago that's very very similar in layout so here it is actually schematically uh, represented uh, very similar uh, that is the compressor that is the turbine so the difference a major difference between the Chrysler design and the uh, Rover design is uh, the first stage turbine and the Rover design is actually a centrifugal uh, turbine as opposed to the axial flow one that we saw in uh, um, the Chrysler just a moment ago, but it has an axial uh, power takeoff uh, turbine that drives the, uh, uh, the output gearbox. So again, very similar uh, with the two um, regenerators uh, for, done for the same reason, fuel economy, and to lower the, uh, the exhaust uh, temperatures. 
So again, you can see here the flow actually comes in, uh, comes up through the uh, the heat exchangers. Yeah, that enter that air is actually warmed by the uh, heat transfer. Uh, goes into the burner can. Uh, the burner can uh, uh, obviously the fuel uh, and the air mixes, and uh, the expansion of the gases actually comes through, drives the first stage turbine, and actually drives the second stage turbine, and again through the heat exchanger before it's expelled. Here's all the drive mechanism here in order to drive the uh, heat exchangers. So very, very similar design, uh, credit where credit's due. Rover did it first, uh, although Chrysler and Rover must have been developing this uh, simultaneously. I think Rover beat them just, just slightly by a couple of years. And here is a cutaway of the engine. Very, very similar again, uh, fuel pump, oil pump on the front, on the gearbox. Uh, although I'll get it, it's tons of detail to actually take in. So I'll leave you with just a few shots of the car because uh, the car itself is a, is a beauty and, des and deserves a couple of pictures to, uh, to close the program. Jay Leno certainly doesn't need my help uh, for anybody to go and watch his videos, but if this at all has, uh, has uh, piqued your interest at all, boys, I suggest you go and check out his channel. He does a great bit. It's about uh, 25 minutes long, half an hour long on a Chrysler turbine. He actually is uh, one of the very, very few uh, people in the world who actually own one. Um, there's very few in private hands. He's one of the guys who owns one, and he does, uh, he does a car... Uh, justice in his piece that he does uh, on it so uh, yeah check it out if you're interested that's that boys cheers